This morning's service is a little different than what we usually do. Uh, Earlier this year, the churches of the Clinton area came together and wanted to do something about a problem that's been afflicting our community for some time and has really uh, captured the attention of many over the last year. But we didn't just want to point out the problem. We also wanted to share the solution. And so we put together a video presentation, which I'd like to show to you this morning, and then we'll follow up uh, with some comments at the end. Uh, the presentation is about 27 and a half minutes long. You'll see at least one familiar face, probably more than one, uh, in this video. Uh, but I pray that you open your hearts and your minds to the message, to the voices that you hear, to the facts that you encounter. And do so asking this question, how can I be not part of the problem, but part of the solution? The video is entitled, Addicted to Death. All across our country, there's an epidemic that's being fought. And it's one that used to exist mostly in urban areas. But for the past few years, it's been working its way into every community. And it's here now in DeWitt County. And the problem is, is people are addicted to this epidemic. They're literally addicted to death. Well, the first Wednesday of March was just a normal day at our church. And uh, my phone rang and it was the sheriff, Jared Schaffner, asking if I could come and be a part of a meeting that was taking place in about 45 minutes. And uh, Jared's a friend. I said, I'd be glad to do it, but what was it about? And he said, it's about our our heroin crisis in, in the community. And uh, at that point, I didn't realize there was a heroin crisis. I had no idea whatsoever. And 20 years of law enforcement, uh, specifically addressing the heroin issue, I don't know that I saw heroin in the first 15 years of my law enforcement career. And so we've seen a tremendous influx. What I have seen here locally in the city of Clinton is in the last couple years. We've seen a really epidemic of, uh, we've had nine or six uh, heroin-related deaths uh, in the last nine months, which is highly unusual for a county this size. You know, it's all around us. Um, I, every time I'm, I'm reading Facebook or I'm, you know, in the last few years, five years, um, overdose after overdose. When we had a rash of overdose deaths in DeWitt County that were traced directly to heroin, it caught a lot of us off guard. Um, This is Clinton, Illinois. This is a community of 7,000 people. This is not what you think of when you think of, you know, the war on drugs or a place where there's a huge drug issue. But um, I left that morning just stunned that um, really under my own eyes, this this problem had really developed. Um, Lives had been lost. But more than that, this this addiction seemed to be really spiraling out of control. It was a stunning revelation. In a short nine month span, there were six fatal overdoses of heroin in DeWitt County. To put that in perspective, the coroner's office estimates that there are only about two motor vehicle deaths in the county each year. Accurate figures on the number of heroin or prescription drug abusers is difficult to track. But between 2001 and 2014, the national average of fatal heroin overdoses has increased sixfold. Part of the reason for this growth and the surge is how cheap heroin is to purchase and how widely it's been distributed. Heroin's been here, uh, but the problem is, is there's a greater supply now, and thus the supply's gone up, so the prices have gone down. You can purchase heroin a lot cheaper than you can buy from prescription pills, and that's created a big problem. The supply chain for a a drug is very similar to the same supply chain used for a widget that that is for sale, you know, at at a local supermarket or something. For the Midwest, the hub of operations, uh, the super Walmart of drugs is Chicago. Uh, Even drugs that are sold here on, on our streets in Clinton, we know that first came up through the southern border, 
went to Chicago, breaking down into distribution chains, and then hit the road again to come to Small Town USA. You know, when it comes to heroin, obviously the, the availability of supply has created a tremendous problem for us. You know, it's no longer a dark alley homeless person who's the drug addict. It's right here in our rural communities. I can make one phone call and have it within like 10 minutes. Here in Clinton. It's not that hard. There's multiple people that I know that uh, do it, that can get it, that have it. Finding heroin isn't hard even here in Clinton. But to help understand why it is so abused, we first need to gain some insights into addiction in general. When most people think about addiction, they tend to think about willpower, it's about morality, it's about not making good choices. When we truly understand the science and the research behind addiction, we've learned that it's actually a brain disease. The, the best model that I use to explain it, though, is that of an infectious disease. So with an infectious disease, there's either a, a virus or a bacteria or some other microorganism, and then there has to be a susceptible host. If there's not a susceptible host, there's no disease. So you have to have both things to result in disease. And likewise, uh, in addiction, you have to have an addictive drug and you have to have a susceptible host as well. Addiction is a type of disease that does not discriminate. So what that means is that a person with a PhD, a person with a high level paying job, you know, a person that's a mother or father can be affected by this illness. The commonality um, among all individuals is that it does devastate their life in some way, shape or form. The case now is your typical middle class kid living in the suburbs, uh, living in a nice residential area who is using heroin, or even more so is the middle-aged person who has become a drug addict that is using heroin. The supply of heroin is in abundance, but what drives the demand? In the late 1990s, the American Pain Society campaigned to make pain what it called the fifth vital sign the doctor should monitor along with respiration, temperature, blood pressure, and heartbeat. Because of this, Prescription for opioids skyrocketed. America has the highest number of prescriptions for opioids. There are enough prescriptions written for painkillers to medicate everyone in the U.S. for a year. People knew that you could become addicted to opioids, but there was a mistaken notion that if someone was taking opioids for pain, that the risk of being addicted was very low, which simply isn't true. And we realize that now, but now uh, we've got the problem that we're dealing with. And um, because of the pressure that physicians felt on the one hand from regulatory and accrediting agencies, and on the other hand from patients who were in chronic pain, they were put in this very uncomfortable position. Um, well, when I was probably 17, um, I started having back pain, you know, and I, you know, didn't know what was going on. I went to the doctor. He just, right off the bat, wrote me a prescription for 90 Vicodin, 90 Xanaxes, and 240 Tramadol. And I took so, took the medication as prescribed and everything, uh, but he kept me on it for long, like I had refills. So I was probably on that for a year. And uh, when I want, you know, just stopped taking it, um, I started having withdrawals. Well, then at that point, I didn't know they were withdrawals. So I called the doctor and I'm like, hey, you know, what is going on? I'm sick. I, you know, I can't sleep. I feel like I'm crawling out of my skin. I, you know, it's awful. And he's like, well, you're experiencing withdrawals. And I said, no, I'm not an addict. You guys, I took it like I was supposed to. What are you talking about? And he goes, and then he explained to me, well, since you've been on it for so long, your body's gotten used to it. And now that you're not taking it, that's why you're sick. So what did he do? Wrote me more medicine. <laughs> <clears throat> 
I think the, you know, one of the very important things uh, to understand about addiction is simply taking an addictive medication does not mean someone is an addict. There are a whole host of behaviors that surround uh, uh, the individual that more or less define addiction. And what I mean here is uh, an individual's life becomes consumed with efforts to afford the drug, obtain the drug, use the drug, cover up using the drug, uh, and uh, worry about the effects of uh, performing in their uh, variety of roles like work and family while under the influence of the drug. When those kinds of things happen, that's when the red flag of addiction should raise its ugly head. Um, but simply taking the drug does not mean that someone is an addict. But people have to be careful with you know what they're doing if they are uh, if they are prescribed medications to be taken in a certain way and they are taking them uh, differently than they are prescribed uh, that's a behavior that they should be careful of I started out when I was 16 I was I had wrecked a car I went to the hospital and the doctor's like well we're gonna put prescribe you some pain meds and I was like okay well that's fine and then 10 years go by, I'm still taking the pain pills. In 2014, um, I couldn't find any more. And I went over to my friend's house and I was like, well, hey, can you get me some, give me some Vicodin or something, something for my pain. And he's like, well, I got some, something else. He's like, um, this will work better than the pain pills. So I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. I was like, uh, what is it? And he's like, it's heroin. And he's like, oh, it's, it's just one time, just one time. Well, that one time was the very first time that I've ever done it. And I snorted it and I liked it a lot. I was like, oh, well, we're gonna, we're gonna go find some more. It's a very rewarding chemical. And so when an individual ingests a mood altering substance, such as an opiate, it lights up that reward system and the brain says, this is good, let's do this again. I started, doc they call it doctor shopping, where uh, you go to different doctors around town to get, you know, different whatever medicines you want, like Vicodin, Oxycontins, Percocets, like all opiates. I ended up being red flagged, which means that, um, like, I, like, when I go into the emergency department, uh, they don't give me no narcotics. Like, I wasn't able to get narcotics prescribed to me. Then one night, I was at a little get-together, and um, a couple of my um, friend, were friends, um, they had heroin, and they were laying out lines. So I did my first line of heroin and uh, fell in love. Like, the moment it hit me and I felt the high, I was in love. And I knew that that was it. It's cheaper to buy, it's easier to buy, um, and it lasts longer. So that's how I got to the point of doing heroin. Brittany and Lori are not alone in their addiction story. Four out of every five heroin users begin their addiction journey with either a legitimate prescription that they can't get a refill for, or that they abuse and self-medicate, or users started recreationally abusing prescription drugs. The thing that has floored me about learning what I have learned about this epidemic was the very first meeting that our coalition got together and we had experts there. And they told, when they t shared with us, the gateway to heroin abuse was prescription pain medicine. That was one of those moments that I, I, I couldn't believe it. They have gotten started on opioids through, a, uh, through the prescription uh, route. Either their doctors don't prescribe it anymore and they go out on the street and they're buying oxycodone and hydrocodone on the street and they find that they can buy heroin for much less price. And so they switch to heroin. 
Prior to being prescribed all, all of the pain pills and everything like that, um, I would have never, ever, I looked down on people like that, people like that. Um, Brandon, Brandon um, had never done a drug in his life um, up to the age of 19. Um, his addiction started uh, five years ago. Uh, he was in introduced um, um, to Oxycontin um, by a friend, and so he had turned to heroin because he could lo no longer get the prescription uh, drugs. So After the first time I did it, I liked it, and I was like, oh, this is just amazing. It's the best feeling in the world. I'm like, I don't need Vicodin anymore for my pain. This is taking care of it. And then it just, it got worse real bad, real fast. It's, it's a, a living nightmare. It's something that, you know, you just don't want to believe. You don't want to believe that your kid is doing this, that your, your daughter, your son that cannot be capable of, of s such a, an addiction. And it's a monster. Um, from that day forward, and every day, if I had the money, I was doing heroin. Um, at first, it was like 40 bucks a day, but then it got to, I spent $550 just on heroin within a week. I was going, I was using about, I'd say about $120, $150 worth a day. I got so addicted to it that I was spending every dime I had. Like, my kids were going without what they needed. and I, I lost my kids. Um, the, it was, okay, Brittany, you're just a piece of shit junkie. You're never gonna get your kids back. Um, you're not good enough, you know, so who cares? You know, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just hurting myself, so it's okay, was my mindset. You, you, you drop to your knees with them because you, you, you grab them and you tell them you don't want them to die. And that was not wanting them to die. You, you knew they were gonna die. You knew. He would, I'd hold him, you know. He'd fall asleep in my arms telling me he didn't want to be an addict. We'd fight. I didn't want him in my house. I thought I, I li literally thought I would die with a needle in my arm in some rundown place, you know, around people who don't care about me. Um, my son, Brandon Stoltenberg, um, was 24 years old and he passed away um, September 19th of uh, 2015, uh, heroin overdose due to a heroin overdose. Um, and uh, that heroin was laced with fentanyl. On its way to the user, heroin is cut or mixed with something to widen the profit margin for the dealer. Recently, heroin has been cut with both fentanyl and carfentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is about 30 to 50 times more lethal than heroin. And carfentanyl is similar to fentanyl but even deadlier, with a potency about 100 times that of fentanyl. It only takes a few ingested granules to kill. And because these are synthetics, they can be cheaply manufactured in the lab and inserted into heroin to make it more addictive and overdoses more likely. When you go and buy any narcotic, you don't know for sure what's in that, because it's not like there's a label on the back that says this has this or contains that. The heroin that people are buying uh, can literally be poisonous. Um, when you pick up a bottle of ibuprofen, you pretty much know what's in those pills. When you buy heroin on the street, you have no idea what's been put in that product from the supply chain down. Heroin by itself is dangerous though. Users find that the longer they use, they have to up their doses to get the same high. The consequences of using are secondary to the rush, even when they see others dying from heroin. I met Sean, and Sean started babysitting for me. I didn't know that he had done dope. But when I found out, I was like, oh, you, you got the connect. You can get it for me. 
And he's like, yeah. And he's like, just drive me up there and we'll go. Oh, we went up there and he had taken a bunch of pills or whatever and he OD'd. Like I had court and he OD'd while I was in court. He was in my car when he died. And the next morning I got up and I went back over to the apartment and shot up twice and took a handful of Vicodin. My sister, she, she came and like she pulled it, she found me sitting in my truck, like nodded out, head on the steering wheel. She came in and like ripped me out of the truck and she's like, Lori, you are going to rehab. And I was like, I want to go, I want to go now, take me. Because I have overdosed, I've overdosed twice. Um, my fiance's sister, uh, she saved my life. She gave me CPR. I was, you know, they found me. They found me uh, unconscious on a bed with a needle in my arm, and I was blue. I was, you know, barely breathing. And uh, they called 911, and she gave me CPR. And thank, you know, thankfully the EMTs were there, and they gave me the Narcan. Naloxone is sold under the brand name Narcan and it can be temporarily used to block the effects of a heroin overdose if administered quickly enough. You know, and, and people bring up Narcan as uh, a way to help turn the epidemic. It's not gonna turn the epidemic. What Narcan does is buys you time. But if you do not follow up with the medical treatment within 45 minutes to an hour, that opiate will reattach to the neuroreceptor in the brain which causes the overdose and so uh, people that think, well, I have Narcan, now I can safely take heroin. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, and if somebody receives Narcan and the overdose is reversed, they're not fine. They still need help. We've in fact seen individuals who were revived from an overdose using a substance called naloxone. And instead of being happy and excited about getting that second chance, they come up swinging, they come up upset and frustrated that their high was reversed. Both Lori and Brittany have had close calls with overdosing and along the way found themselves arrested at various times. Fortunately, through rehab treatments and other efforts, they are both clean today. I looked 10 times better than I did when I left. I was 95 pounds when I went into jail and I got came out of rehab at 155 pounds and I've been sober ever since. I'm working my program, I'm going to my meetings, I'm doing my counseling, I'm doing my parenting classes so I can have my family back and get my life back on track. Life now is amazing. Um, I can have my kids stay the night with me on the weekends. Um, and uh, I do give credit to drug court because they played a huge part of me getting clean and being able to be here still, you know, clean. Life's better when you're sober and you can remember things. I do. I remember everything I did yesterday and today and the day before that. Six months ago, I couldn't. Well, life's good. Sober. Heroin is here, and its effects are real. The question is, is there anything that can be done? In a county this small, there's very few people that I don't know. And um, when you see things like this to people that you know very well, uh, it, it's heartbreaking and, and devastating, really, to, to me. Um, we look at statistics and we think, man, there's, there, there, it seems so hopeless that, that people that are, that are on heroin and other drugs even, uh, and, the, and you look at the statistics and it, and, it, and it seems like we might as well throw up our hands and, but I, I want people to know that you're not alone. There is help and there is hope. You know, the law enforcement family sees drug addiction much closer than most people and, and we see it destroy lives. We see it tear apart families all too frequently. 
And a lot of people have this misconception about law enforcement that we want to see people locked up in jail. And when it comes to drug addicts or people with any type of addiction, that's not really our goal. Our goal is to make sure that everybody lives a happy, full, and productive life. Just like the officer said, we've got to get them to a facility to get help. It's not to be arrested, but it's to get help. And it, this is what this coalition's about. This is what we're trying to do here in our Dewitt County, is that to get help, not to, to put people down, to put them in jail. That's not what it's about. It's beyond a police matter. It's beyond an EMS matter. Um, this is something that's gonna take an entire community. It's gonna take the faith-based. It's gonna take uh, families, friends, you know, working together. And I want people that are struggling, regardless of whether it's them or a family member, I want them to know that they are loved in this community. There's churches that have, that have, that are bending over backwards, and they want to be there to say, "Hey, you can call on us. You can come to us. We'll come to you." A way to help is don't look at us as junkies and, you know, criminals and bad people. Look at us as broken people who need your help and need your love and support and guidance, you know, because that's what we are. We're, we're broken people. We have been, I think, shocked into an awareness of what's going on and reminded of the awesome responsibility that we have, not only as ministers, but as churches. I can't tell, I cannot say that I would never do it again because nobody knows. But I can try my darn, uh, I could try my hardest not to do it. I don't want to. I don't like the drug now. I, I, I did. And I don't like what it's doing to other people because I look back and I'm like, I look like that person. I looked like that person six months ago. It's like, it's hard to believe that that was a part of my life now because I'm a completely different person from than I was four years ago, <laughs> you know? But yeah, that's what I would say. I believe that the ultimate answer is in the hope of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul put, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that if anyone's in Christ, they're new. They're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And I think that's the case for people that have um, baggage in their past that they're, they're embarrassed about. I think when they come to Christ, they're new. But I think that's the case for someone that's battling addiction. And just some of the folks that I've had the chance to visit with there's a real um, fear that because I battle addiction, it has to be a lifelong battle. It will be a lifelong battle. And I really believe with the resources that law enforcement has and that addiction recovery has alongside the answers that I think Jesus Christ has, um, recovery can be a reality and it can be a lifetime victory. I hope that that opened our eyes to what's happening right here in small town USA. Those recovering addicts that you saw live right here. One lives in Clinton, one lives in Kinney. There are addicts probably that you know, but you may not know that they're addicts. You may know some that are recovering addicts. They may be sitting right here in this room this morning. What do we do? What do we as a church do? And just for a few moments, I'd like to 
Go back to the scripture that was read earlier from Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And you see throughout his writings, both in the prophecy that bears his name and in the book of Lamentations that follows it, he was broken hearted. In chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, Oh, that my head were a spring of water, that my eyes were a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. I wonder how many of us are brought to tears over the lives that are lost right here in our community. When you pick up a newspaper or you hear it on the evening news, does it break our hearts? Do we understand that here is a family that's been torn apart? Now, I'm not trying to make excuses. And I think we've got to be careful in how we project the message. Um, You've heard me say before, I have a real problem with saying that addiction is a disease. It doesn't just happen. It is the consequence of choice. And we need to take responsibility for our choices and understand that the only way you're ever going to get out of addiction is through making good choices. But addiction is real. And many people, like the ones we've seen today, did not go in hoping to become addicts. These are folks who are in pain. And that really has struck me as I've learned more about this. They mentioned in the video that 80% of all heroin addicts got started with prescription pain medicine. Many of them for legitimate physical pain. But it makes them feel so good and they want that feeling again and again. And then they need something stronger to get it back. And it just escalates. Some people don't need pain medicine for physical pain, but I think they take it because they're hurting in other ways. They're hurting emotionally. They may not know it, but they're hurting spiritually. They have no hope. They have no purpose in life. And so they turn to pain pills because we have said that pain is evil. Pain is something that must be killed, so we have pain killers. If somebody is in pain, we must medicate them and get them to stop feeling the pain. The problem is we're not addressing the pain. We're putting a Band-Aid over a broken bone. We're, We're not treating the issue. And for those who recreationally use pain killers... They're not using it for any physical pain in their bodies, but there's pain inside. And rather than dealing with what's causing that pain, they just want to mask the pain. They just want to escape the pain. What do we do? What do we as Christians do? I think it begins with an attitude. And I will confess that for a long, long time, I looked down on addicts, alcoholics, drug abusers, whatever it might be. Oh, they're weak. They're sinners. They're no good. They're criminals. They're junkies. No, they're broken people. Just like you and I are broken. Our sin is not any less than their sin just because they sin differently than us. They still have the same need. But for many of us, we have found the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. Going back to Jeremiah, verse 22 of chapter 8. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And the way that's phrased in the original language, it anticipates the answer, yes, there is. Gilead was well known for its healing balm and its physicians. 
Yes, there is hope. Yes, there is help. And then he concludes, why then is there no healing? We have the balm. We have the answer. We have the healing. Not that you and I can heal them ourselves, but we can put them in touch with Jesus Christ, who alone can heal and who alone can break the bonds of sin. There is a balm in Gilead. Why then is there no healing? Maybe we're not doing enough to get the answer out there. And it doesn't have to be in Chicago or St. Louis, the big urban centers. It doesn't even have to be in Decatur or Bloomington. It's right here, folks. Look around. There are people that are hurting all around us. And I am convinced that as a body of Christ, we need our hearts broken. We need to be brought aware which is what I think the beauty of this video is. Be brought aware of the truth of our situation. But realize that we don't throw up our hands. We have hope. We have answers. But I think it has to begin with a heart of love. We have to love these people. We have to stop looking down on them. We need to stop criticizing condemning I'm not saying you excuse their actions but see past their actions get past the sin and see the sinner isn't that what Jesus did that's what we're called to do now how each one of us responds is probably going to be different I would just say make this a matter of prayer And make this your prayer. Lord, open my eyes to people I already know who are hurting, who are in pain, and who need Jesus. And then give me the opportunity to share. You may not save a heroin addict. You may never come in contact with a heroin addict. But pray for them. A lot of them are depending on Narcan, which was talked about here. Narcan's a wonderful thing, but it's only temporary. And something that wasn't mentioned in the video, and I wish it was, remember how they said that heroin is often mixed with other drugs like fentanyl? Those other drugs, including fentanyl, if there is an overdose, Narcan doesn't work. Those six heroin overdoses in DeWitt County, every one of them was laced with fentanyl. Narcan could not have saved them even if we had it. It's no miracle. It will get you by. But unfortunately, a lot of the heroin addicts have looked at this as like, oh, here's my safety net. Long as my buddy's got Narcan, if I overdose, he can revive me and then I can get high again doesn't work that way we've got to tell people the truth but even more so we need to give them hope so I'm asking that you make this a matter of prayer what can we do as a church what can we do as individuals to reach out to the hurting people in our community we've already done one thing as a church we helped sponsor that video in fact we were one of the first churches that stepped up and helped sponsor that video. And we are working as churches, representatives of your church are at work in the community in dealing with these issues. Make it a matter of prayer. These are lost souls. These are people for whom Jesus died. And they are no less worthy of his grace 